morning and welcome to On the Road with Jesus. My name is Rhody Fisher and we're coming to you live from Hope Radio here in Corona, California. And thank you, Clint Gonzalez and 3-in-1 for that beautiful song. <clears throat> Let's pray. Father, we ask that you would search us, O Lord, and know our heart. Try us and know our thoughts. See if there's any wicked way about us, Lord, and lead us in the way of everlasting. Father, we ask that you would um, be in our thoughts, our hearts, whatever we say, the words that we speak. Lord, we want it, be, it to be all about you. Be with Sean and Guy, who are in the booth there, and my special guest, Carrie, who's come a long way, and it was really hard for him to get here. So I really appreciate it, Lord. So, Father, we just give you the show. In Jesus' name, amen. Amen. <clears throat> Good morning, listeners. We are going to be in Psalm 17, which is the next psalm that we are going to do. And um, this is David again, seeking the Lord, asking him um, to look at his cause. He's, he feels like he's got a just cause that he's fighting for. Other people are against him. And he's, he's wondering if the Lord could step in and, and take care of him. And, and he's going to give him all the things that he thinks is um, is um, on his side, mainly his pure heart. He's saying, "Look at my heart, Lord. I I I've got this pure heart here. I, there's nothing against me." So anyhow, <clears throat> here goes a prayer of David: "Hear a just cause, O Lord." And that phrase, "Hear a just cause, O Lord." Wait a minute, Carrie. I didn't plan to do this. But what is that in Hebrew? Because I see this a lot in Psalms, this phrase, see a just cause, O Lord. Okay, um, let, me just, let, me, let me look at it. And, and in, the, in, the, in the King James, it's hear the right, O Lord, attend to my cry and give ear to my prayer. I feel like I've heard that. So what is, what is the English for this? What did you say? Hear the right. O Lord, hear the right, O Lord. Attend unto my cry, give ear to my prayer that goeth not out of feigned lips. Okay, the Hebrew is Tefillah le David, which is a prayer of David, a Psalm of David. Shema Adonai Tzedek, God listen to righteousness. Okay. Okay, and then what is the next English? The next English is. Let my sentence come forth from thy presence. Let thy eyes behold the things that are equal. No, no, no. Still in, in, in the first verse. Oh, no. Okay. Still in the first verse. That goeth not out of my feigned, feigned lips. How, can, can I see the, um, the Bible, please? Yeah. I want, to, I want to match the translation to the original Hebrew. Okay. Attend my cry. Give ear unto my prayer. So that's Shema Adonai Tzedek Hakshiva Rinasi, which means um, listen, God, to my to righteous. It doesn't seem to say cry in there, but listen uh, to the okay. Then okay, listen to my prayer. Rinasi, my prayer. Azina Tfilasi. Okay, I I wish I would have prepared for this. Hakshiva Rinasi would be listen to my cry. You see, the Hebrew has something more in here than the English does. That's what's confusing me. Below, kalos vasimirma, that giveth not a faint lips. So, when it says to feel, shema adonai tzedek, that's hear the right, O Lord, tzedek righteousness. Hakshiva rinasi, attend to my cry. Zinas filasi, give ear to my prayer. That below Svasai Mirma, that goeth not out of feigned lips. In other words, he's praying to God, crying to God, but it's in his mind. He's not actually mouthing the words. Okay, I, I, I hear you. I, the reason I said that 
you could if you could read it because the the hear a just cause, O Lord, or or that phrase seems to come up a lot in in Psalms. So I just wondered what what does it translate? But you know what? Let's just read it. I'm I'm sorry I jumped in there. I'm throwing everyone off. I apologize. No, when it says here, the main point is, in the translation it says right. The Hebrew says tzedek. Tzedek means righteousness. So the, the King James here, which is right, it, it's, it's meaning righteousness. Okay. Okay. Let me go to verse 2 now that we've really knocked back uh, verse 1. My vindication c come from your presence. Let your eyes look up on the things that are upright. You have tested my heart. You have visited me in the night. You have tried me and found nothing. I have purposed that my mouth shall not transgress. Concerning the works of men, by the word of your lips, I have kept away from the paths of the destroyer. Uphold my steps in your paths that my footsteps may not slip. I have called upon you, for you will hear me, O Lord. Decline your ear to me and hear my speech. Show my marvelous loving, show your marvelous loving kindness by your right hand. You who save those who trust you from those who rise against them. Keep me as an apple of your eye. Hide me under the shadow of your wings from the wicked who oppress me, from the deadly enemies who surround me. Have They have closed up their fat hearts with their mouths and speak proudly. They have now surrounded us in our steps. They have set their eyes crouching down to the earth as a lion eagerly to tear up his prey. And like a lion, and like a young lion lurking in the secret places, arise, O Lord, comfort him, cast him down, deliver my life from the wicked with your sword, with your hand from men. Oop, sorry, I touched my phone. From, <clears throat> from men of the world who have their portion in his life, in this life, and those whose belly fill with your hidden treasure, they are satisfied with children and leave the rest of their possession for their babies. As for me, I will see your face in righteousness. I shall be satisfied when I awake in your likeness. Okay. Thank you for your word, Lord. Um, okay. I, I'm just going to read that. There was... Um, I. Anyway, thank you. I just wanted to um, remind the listeners that I think your first show was show eight, episode eight. And so we're having Carrie Hoffman again. And... Carrie, welcome back. Thank you very much. And I understand we're going to be talking about why you feel this is this is your interpretation that Jews don't accept Christ so readily. Is that is that? Yes, it's absolutely correct. That's what I want to talk about today. Okay, so you've had first-hand experience with this, and you've probably experienced it with other Jewish people that you've witnessed to. So this is just your interpretation of why um, the Jewish people are not so ready to accept Jesus as their Savior um, or their Messiah. Okay, so, Carrie. Well, well, it's obvious. You know, I wanted to talk about this subject because Christians may feel bad that Jesus' own people didn't accept him. Mm hmm Okay, that's why I wanted to do this. And, you know, while there is interpretation here and there is opinion 
in my talks, I mean, the fact is the Jewish people as a whole do not accept Jesus. Jesus is not a part of the Jewish religion. Now, there are individuals that have come to Christ that are Jews, that there's a Messianic Jewish movement where, they, um, where Jews come together and worship God through Christ. So it does exist. So in this talk, I want to I wanna make two major subpoints about this. Number one, I don't want anyone's faith to be diminished because the Jews don't accept Christ. In other words, if you're thinking, well, why should I accept him when his own people doesn't? Don't, I don't recommend thinking that way. And second of all, don't, do not hate the Jews or be angry at them or resent them for not accepting Christ. Don't be anti-Semitic. Okay, there's a whole, there's a whole reason why, there's several reasons why. And in the end times, we're told that there are Jews, most of the Jews will come and accept Christ in the very end. So the first question you have to ask is, what did God say about the Jews in the Bible? What, what is the nature of the Jewish people? And if we look at Deuteronomy in chapter 9, verses 5 and 6, he says, Not for thy righteousness or for the uprightness of thine heart dost thou go to possess their land. Talking about the land of Israel. But for the wickedness of these nations, the Lord thy God doth drive them out from before thee, and that he may perform word which the Lord swear unto thy fathers, Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. Understand therefore that the Lord thy God giveth thee not this good land to possess it for thy righteousness, for thou art a stiff-necked people. And my point for reading these verses is being labeled a stiff-necked people. Stiff-necked is stubborn. So when I read this, I thought this meant that God had chosen the Jewish people despite the fact that they were a stiff-necked people. This means that they're stubborn, resistant to change, strong in their convictions, they find tradition very important, and are not easily convinced to change their minds. But then I thought, maybe God is saying he chose the Jewish people not in spite of the fact that they are stiff-necked, but precisely because they are stiff-necked. He needed the chosen people to be a stiff-necked people, ones that will stand their ground and will hold onto their positions and not give up their traditions and convictions. He wanted a nation that would not easily accept anything new, but would hold on to the old. This is the nature of the Jewish people. So let's talk about the crucifixion of Jesus Christ. In Matthew chapter 16, verses 21 to 23, it says, From that time forth began Jesus to show unto his disciples how that he must go unto Jerusalem and suffer many things of the elders and priests and scribes, and be killed, and be raised again the third day. Then Peter took him, and began to rebuke him, saying, Be it far from thee, Lord, this shall not be unto thee. But he turned and said unto Peter, Get behind me, Satan. Thou art an offense to me, for thou savorest not the things that be of God, but those that be of men. Interesting, when he said, Jesus, I hope you don't get crucified, Jesus called him Satan. Mm -hmm. The crucifixion had to happen. It was God's will that Jesus be crucified. Although such a thing is a terrible thing, trying to kill God himself, it was absolutely necessary for our salvation. Without the cross, there would be no salvation. Right. It had to happen for the salvation of the world. Okay, so now we go to John chapter 19, verses 14 through 16. And we see that the leaders of the Jews called for Jesus' crucifixion. And it was the preparation of the Passover, and about the sixth hour, and he said unto the Jews, Behold your king. This is the Romans talking to the Jews. Right. But they cried out, Away with him, away with him, crucify him. Pilate said unto them, Shall I crucify your king? The chief priests, which by the way, they're the Sadducees, mm. answered, We have no king but Caesar. Then delivered he them, therefore, unto them to be crucified. And they took Jesus and led him away. Hmm. Without the Jews, without their being stubborn, without their rejecting Christ, without being a stiff-necked people, the crucifixion would not have happened. It was yeah. almost like a setup. God chose the people that would resist, and then they resisted. 
In order for the world to be saved, for you and me and everybody in the audience to be saved, it had to happen this way. Okay. You know, you know what's amazing? Okay, I'll, I'll talk about that later. Now, let's talk about the Jewish expectation of Messiah. Okay? There's another very important point here. When the Jews expected the Messiah, what the Jews expected to do, what the Messiah to do was not the same thing as what the Messiah actually came to do. We know that the purpose of Messiah, at least during this visit, this first visit, was to save the world from its sins. Salvation was the purpose of Jesus' first visit. Mm -hmm. It says in Isaiah 53, 5, but he was wounded for our transgressions, he was bruised for our iniquities, the chastisement of our peace was upon him, and with his stripes we are healed. But the Jews expected and believed that the Messiah would free them from oppression and persecution. In this instance, free them from the rule of Rome. Even to this day, the Jewish people look to the Messiah for freedom from foreign Gentile rule and self governance independence, and peace. This is why the Jews were so excited when Jesus entered Jerusalem. In Luke 19, it says, chapter 37 to 40, And when he was come nigh, even now at the descent of the mountain of Olives, the whole multitude of the disciples began to rejoice and praise God with a loud voice for all the mighty works they had seen, saying, Blessed be the king that cometh in the name of the Lord. Peace in heaven and glory in the highest. And some of the Pharisees from among the multitude said to the Master, Rebuke thy disciples. And he answered and said unto them, If I tell you that, if these should hold their peace, the stones would immediately cry out. What happened? They got very dismayed when he didn't oust Rome from Jerusalem. Mm -hmm. Okay, They were sure he was going to come in and kick out Rome. Mm -hmm. The anger and hatred for Jesus for not accomplishing that, that anger even reached levels of absurdity and ridiculousness. Now, if we go back to John 19, which I already read, when they said, we have no king but Caesar, this is, this is ironic. This is ridiculous. Imagine, they were so mad at Jesus that they seemed to have lost their minds. Remember, the enemy was Rome. And Jesus was supposed to, at least in their minds, overthrow Rome. But when, but they were so mad at Jesus that, that he didn't overthrow Rome, they actually turned him over to the Romans for crucifixion. And in negotiating this, they actually told the Romans, we have no other king but Caesar. This is how crazy it was. Can you imagine that? They hated the Romans. But they got so mad at Jesus, they lost perspective. And they, they said, we have no other king but Caesar. That's unbelievable. Hmm. On a side note, I also find it ironic that the main Christian church, the Catholic church, also let Rome overtake it too. When Constantine took over the church and established the Roman Catholic church. So I find it funny, how the, not funny but ironic, how the people actually... The people that actually did the crucifixion of Jesus, the Romans, now control the church. Or at least the Catholic Church. Yeah, the Catholic Church. Yeah, that's but not I know. the church. I know, the Catholic Church. Mm -hmm. So I find that ironic. Okay, now let's get back to the call for Jews for Jesus' crucifixion. I also want to point out that it was the chief priests, it says the chief priests that were saying these things. The chief priests, as we know from other verses, were the Sadducees, not the Pharisees. Now, the Sadducees were Jews, just like the Pharisees, but they were, but the uh, Jewish religion of today descends from the Pharisees, not the Sadducees. So modern rabbinical Judaism is a development of, of Phariseal Judaism, not Sadduceal Judaism. The Sadducees were a sect that disappeared after the destruction of the temple. They don't exist anymore. So don't blame today's Jews for the crucifixion. The Jews of today come from the Pharisees, not the Sadducees. Oh, it was, interesting. It was the Sadducees that called for Jesus' crucifixion and declared allegiance to, to Rome here. Hmm. But, you see, the Jewish people actually did not need a Messiah to free themselves from oppression and foreign rule. God, through Moses told them how to live in the land peacefully and independently in the Old Testament in Deuteronomy chapter 11, verses 13 through 17. 
And it shall come to pass, if you shall listen diligently unto my commandments, which I command you this day, to love the Lord your God and serve him with all your heart and with all your soul, then I will give you the rain of your land in its due season, the first rain and the latter rain, that thou mayest gather in thy corn, thy wine and thine oil, and I will send grass in the fields for thy cattle, that thou may eat and be full. Take heed to yourselves, that your heart not be deceived, and you turn aside and serve other gods and worship them. Then the Lord's wrath will be kindled against you, and he will shut up the heaven, and there will be no rain, and that the land will not yield her fruit, and you will perish quickly off of the good land which the Lord gives you. It's very simple. If the Jews listen to God, to his commandments, to love God and to worship him, and not get involved in idolatry or other, other things that go against God's will, they would have never had a problem with Rome. The admonition against the Jewish people is even more harsh and severe in Deuteronomy 28. But I'm not going to quote it here at this time. It's, if you ever want to, after this show, look at Deuteronomy 28, you'll see it's, it's really bad. All the Jews needed to do was to listen to God's commandments and to love the Lord and serve him with all their heart, soul, and might. Jesus actually gave the Jewish people a second chance to return to God, this time based on grace and faith. And had they followed Jesus and listened to what he told them, maybe there would have been a, a better outcome. A better outcome how? For them. For them. Okay. In dealing with foreign, um, you know, oppressors. Mm-hmm. Okay. But, okay. Now, Jesus gave his own advice to what to do in regards to Rome. In Matthew 10, verse 23, But when they persecute you in this city, flee ye unto another. For verily I say unto you, you shall not have gone over the cities of Israel till the Son of Man be come. They could have avoided the terrible consequences of Rome, crushing the rebellion the Jews started, and maybe even avoided being kicked out completely from the land of Israel, only to suffer persecution worldwide in places such as the Arab world and in Europe. I find it very sad. See, Jesus tells us, not to fight, but to protect ourselves, to run. It's like in Ephesians, put on the armor of God. He never said, attack. You let God protect you, and you let God do the fighting. Mm-hmm. That's the right way. Mm-hmm. You know, after the um, destruction of the temple, the Jews appointed their own Messiah, rebelled against Rome, had a short-lived success. The Romans brought all their legions into Israel, flattened them, kicked them all out of the land of Israel, and started the 2,000-year exile. Mm -hmm. So the next question is, why should the Jews accept Christ? You know, why don't the Jews? Well, why should they? Well, they have been looking for their Messiah. I would think that they would have taken a real good look at Jesus as, as being the Messiah, even now. Well, there are some people that are beginning to figure that out. And I'm going to talk about that in a minute. But I'm going to tell you this that's very interesting. The reason, one of the reasons, there's many reasons why the Jews should accept Messiah. But one of the most blatant ones is that God, through Moses, told them to in the Old Testament. Did you know that in the Old Testament, um, it tells them to accept Jesus? In Deuteronomy 18, verses 17 through 19. And the Lord said to me, they have well spoken that which they have spoken. I will raise them up a prophet from among their brethren like unto thee, and will put words in his mouth, and he shall speak unto them all that I shall command him. And it shall come to pass that whosoever will not listen to my words, which he shall speak in my name, I will require it of him. Mm-hmm. Who could he possibly be talking about? Mm-hmm. Jesus. Can't be, I mean, the first thought is, was it Elijah the prophet? Elijah didn't command them anything, didn't tell them. It could only be Jesus. Mm-hmm. And then why should the Jews follow the New Testament? Well, the Bible tells them to again. God through Moses in Deuteronomy 30, verses 11 through 14. For this commandment which I command thee this day is not hidden from thee, neither is it far off. It is not in heaven that you should say, Who shall go up for us to heaven and bring it to us, that we may hear it and do it? 
neither is it beyond the sea that you should say, Who shall go over the sea for us and bring it to us, that we may hear it and do it? But the word is very near to you, in your mouth and in your heart, that you may do it. Now think about this. It's not up in heaven, saying, Who's going to go up into heaven? Well, Moses climbed Mount Sinai. Uh-huh. It's not over the sea. Well, didn't the Jews cross the Red Sea to get to Mount Sinai? Uh-huh. So it's clearly not talking about the Old Testament. It's clearly not talking about the Testament at the time. It's clearly talking about the future New Testament because he says it's in your mouth when you confess your sins and you can and, and, and then in your heart when you accept Jesus in your heart that thou may do it and then your works are done as a result of your confession and your faith. That's not That's the Old great. Testament. That's great. It's right there. So in the (laughs) Old Testament, in the book of Deuteronomy, one of the five books of Moses, Moses clearly tells them that there is going to be Jesus and there is going to be a New Testament. It's also interesting because it seems like Moses knew Jesus. I believe that when he encountered the burning bush in Egypt, he encountered Jesus because Jesus identified himself as I will be what I will be. I know some of the translations say, I am what I am. But the actual Hebrew is, I will be what I will be. Someone who is going to be in the future, someone who's coming to earth one day. right? Not the father. The father, you know, the father doesn't come to earth. The son comes to earth. And he also was with Jesus on the Mount of Transfiguration when he was with Jesus and Elijah. So Moses had encounters with Jesus, mm-hmm. both in the Old Testament and the New Testament. Interesting. So what happened? What okay? We know we know what happened at the time of Christian, but in the but after that, the period after that, what stopped the Jews from accepting Christ? And in one word, I'm going to say religion. Religion is what happened. In Matthew five, tradition, eight, not tradition, religion. I know, but tradition too. Tradition is a part of religion. Yeah. Anyway, in Matthew five eighteen, it says, "For verily I say unto you." Till heaven and earth pass, not one one jot or one tittle shall in no way pass from the law, till all be fulfilled. He said, till all be fulfilled. Jesus fulfilled and completed the law on the cross, thereby ending the Mosaic law, the law of Moses. And and in Romans 3.20, the Apostle Paul says, Therefore, by the deeds of the law, there shall no flesh be justified in his sight, for by the law is the knowledge of sin. And in verse 28, it says, Therefore we conclude that a man is justified by faith and without the deeds of the law. Mm -hmm. So you see, when Jesus went up on the cross, not only did he free us from the punishment of sin, he also freed us from religion. The law. The law, which is religion. Mm -hmm. Okay. Christianity, at its essence, the way I define it, is not a religion but a faith. Okay. It's a relationship. It's it is right. It is the faith in the Jewish Messiah, Jesus of Nazareth, and the subsequent relationship that mm-hmm. you form with him. Right? Mm-hmm. Judaism is a religion. Roman Catholicism is a religion. Islam is a religion. They have clergy. Often the clergy places themselves above God. They like to rewrite the law. They say they have the power to change the laws according to their will. Right? And in order to be saved, you have to do works, right? Each of these religions, okay, now the problem is the clergy, founder of these religions, actually seem to have gotten in the way of man's coming to God. Now, I'm not saying that Christianity doesn't have the elements of religion. It is a religion based on faith in the sense that we have churches, we have Bible studies, all of that. But when you talk about Catholicism or, or much of the Jewish Orthodox world, it's organized. There's actually an organization of people, and there's a leader, and there's a headquarters. And the leaders say, you have to give us honor, you have to give us glory, and you have to listen to what we say, even if it goes against the Bible. That's what I'm saying. When I say religion, that's what I mean. Okay, so you are you keep mentioning the Catholics, but there are some Catholics that are saved. I'm not talking about individual Catholics. Okay. The, the actual people that are Catholics are, are just as saved as any other Christians. I'm talking about the um, religious, the, the clerical structure, mm-hmm. you know, the clergy, 
you know, the pope, the cardinals, the bishops, that okay. that whole structure requiring Catholics to uh, engage in sacraments in order to be saved, you know, those kinds of things. Anyway, let's first talk about rabbinic Judaism, because we're going back to the subject of why the Jews don't accept Christ. After the temple in Jerusalem was destroyed in 70 AD, the law as given to God by Moses was unobservable. It was all centered around the temple. The temple, yes. The law centered around the temple in Jerusalem where animal sacrifices were made, and that all stopped. So the rabbis of the time, the Pharisees, reinvented Judaism and based it on what they call the oral law. The oral law is, they believe that God gave the written law, which is the Bible, the oral law, which was never written down. And later, they decided to write it down, and that is what we call the Talmud. Okay. Okay. Yeah. So they replaced the temple with the synagogue and with the rabbinical school, and they replaced the sacrifices with prayers and study. They also gave the Jews strict rules not to follow Jesus. They were threatened with all kinds of spiritual consequences and even physical ones if they did. I mean, specifically, they would say not to follow Jesus. Yeah. The... Oh, okay. They even went as far as to instruct the Jews, and this is the crazy part, not to study the parts of the books of the prophets in the Bible that talk about Messiah. Instead, just concentrate on the five books of Moses and the Talmud. So they, you know, the, you know Isaiah, Daniel, all those books that, that have all the messianic prophecies, they were no-go zones. Mm -hmm. I mean, they accepted it as part of the Bible, it's just part that was, you know, never really looked at, except for a few excerpts here and there. Now let's go back to Roman Catholicism. I'm sorry. I apologize to any Catholics that are offended by this. It isn't meant to offend you. You know, like I told you, Catholic people are great people. You know, and I love you just as much as any other Christians or anybody else. So I'm but you're ta talking about the religion. I'm itself. talking about the the religion, the structure. Okay. So the Christian Church got overtaken by Rome, and they created the papacy, and the Catholic leaders created their own new religion based on the Jesus story. They invented the idea of sacraments, the new priesthood, and made changes to the laws just as the rabbis did. Just as the rabbis moved the days and observances of the holidays to suit their needs, which they did, the Catholic Church did the same thing, moving the Sabbath and Easter both to Sunday. I know that we today, even in the Protestant and born-again churches, celebrate Sunday as our day of rest. Mm -hmm. But the reason why is different than the reason why it was moved. We are justified in doing that, but not for the original reasons they had back then. The early church felt they had the authority to change the law, the commandments, just like the Pharisees did and the rabbis did. We, however, as Christians, do not actually observe the Sabbath, Right? Jesus is the Lord of the Sabbath. He completed and fulfilled the Sabbath for us, and we observe it through our faith in Jesus. However, we remember the Sabbath, and a remembrance can be done any time. So we remember the Sabbath on Sunday. And um, we do that because that's the Lord's Day of Resurrection, so we choose that to, to remember the Sabbath on. And another example of a remembrance not being tied to a physical time is the difference between the communion and the Passover Seder, mm -hmm. right? The Passover Seder has to happen in Passover, in the spring. You don't have a Passover Seder in October. Mm -hmm. But you can take communion any time of the year. Yes. Because it's a remembrance. Jesus said, do this in remembrance. Do it every me. day if you want to. Do it. You could do it three times a day. The point is, a remembrance is not tied to the physical realm. It's in, it's, it's in the spiritual realm. So we can remember the Sabbath on Sunday, okay? And remember, when the Ten Commandments were given, in Exodus, when God gave the Ten Commandments, he said, remember the Sabbath day. But when Moses repeated it for the Jews in Deuteronomy, he said, observe the Sabbath day as you have been commanded. Mm. See, it's a difference. Right. Okay. So, the early church made changes like this, at least in part, to make their religion distinct and different than Judaism. That was one of the, I'm sure that was one of their motivations. 
and tried very hard to cover over and hide the Jewish roots of Christianity. That's definitely for sure. They gave Christianity a Gentile flavor and minimized or even negated the Jewish connection. They even went as far as to believe in what is called replacement theology, where they believe the Jews have been replaced by the church and are of no consequence anymore to God. The time of the Jews is done, and now the Christian church is the new Jews. But that replacement theology is not what Christians believe today. No. I mean, there are There are some churches people, that yeah, do. Even, but there, are even, there are even some Protestant churches. Right, but you're not talking about the the meat or the... I'm, I'm focusing more on the early church, you know, leading into the Middle Ages, you know, and um, I'm, trying, I'm trying to set up what the scenario is for a Jew that is thinking about accepting Christ and he sees the, the Jewish community he's deeply embedded in telling him you better not, and then he looks at the Catholics and see how anti-Jewish they are, and he's like, well, I don't think I could do that. That's that's my whole point in all of this. It's not to insult anybody. I'm just trying to trying to build what the environment was, what the situation was. It made very hard for a Jew to convert to a religion where he feels he's the enemy. Right. That's that's my point. But this replacement theology is the furthest thing from the truth, because we see in the end times it talks about the Jews returning to Israel, which they have, and we see that this actually happened. But what a bad taste they would give a Jew about Christianity. Right. And it's really hard for someone to separate faith in Christ with, you know, the whole church structure. You know, a lot of people just see that as one thing. And, and we as Christians, ever since the Reformation, have been able to extract faith in Jesus and separate it from a church that has kind of gone off the wrong direction. You know, <clears throat> when I talk to some of my Jewish friends... Their, their, their big deal is how they were treated by Christians, treated badly over the, over the centuries. And they like to point out Hitler because they, they point out that he came from a Christian background. Whether he was or not, I don't believe that. But, Again, but that's, I, that, they connect that. They also... Um, I am going to talk about that. Oh, okay. I am going to bring Let that Let me back up. off then. <laughs> okay, before we go to that, so anti-Semitism is a subject that I want to bring up, right? But I have one more thing I want to say okay, here. Okay, go ahead. And the, the little little subject I have here is Christian terms that sound foreign to Jews. We also see that very many Jewish concepts sound very foreign and Gentile to Jews in Christianity. This is either due to poor translations you know, or, or, or translations of translation, making Christianity seem something very different and foreign to the Jews. But it really isn't. And I'll give you two, two obvious examples for me. One is the word Christ. Christ is like the Christian, most Christian word on earth, but it's only the Greek translation of the word Messiah. Mm -hmm. You know, when you say Jesus Christ, you're basically saying Jesus Messiah. Right? Messiah is a very Jewish concept. And then... Another one which throws Jews off is the term Holy Ghost or Holy Spirit. I don't want to, spirits and ghosts, yeah? Mm -hmm. But it's a translation of a very Jewish concept. It's called the Ruach HaKodesh. And Jews believe in the Ruach HaKodesh. They believe that that's where prophecy comes from. And it's even mentioned my name in the Psalms. So the Holy Ghost is actually an Old Testament, uh, an Old Testament um, phenomenon. And, and, you know, it's just, it doesn't sound Jewish. And even Mary, the uh, mother of a baby Jesus, Mary is a very Gentile name, but Mary is just the Greek translation of the name Miriam. Miriam is a Jewish name. That was Moses' sister was Miriam. In essence, Moses' sister and Jesus' mother had the same name, just in our Bible they're translated differently. Mm -hmm. Now let's talk about anti-Semitism. Mm. Anti-Semitism, to define it, is the discrimination, hatred, and persecution, and even killing of the Jews. This includes the accusations and the blood libels and the pogroms and finally the Nazi Holocaust. Mm -hmm. Now, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to bring up the subject, were the Nazis really Christians? Okay, they may have been in Christian families, but they were not Christians. In 1 John, 
1334, it says, A new commandment I give unto you, that you love one another as I have loved you, and ye also love one another. And in Second John chapter 1, it says, And now I beseech you, lady, not as though I wrote a new commandment unto you, but that which we had from the beginning, that we love one another. And this is love, that we walk after his commandments. This is the commandment that you have heard from the beginning, you should walk in it. And then in Matthew chapter 5, verse 44, But I say to you, love your enemies, bless them that curse you, do good to them that hate you, and pray for them which despitefully use you and persecute you. A true Christian loves. A true Christian does not hate. A true Christian is not a racist. He's not anti-Semitic or any other kind of hater. If somebody says they're Christian and they're involved in hate, they're not a Christian. The Nazis were not Christians. Okay, they could call themselves that, but that's not what they were. You will know them by their fruit. Yeah. So there are people that claim to be Christians, that claim to represent Christ and Christianity, but have hate in their heart, and they give a bad name for Christ and do a lot of damage. Mm -hmm. And Matthew chapter 7 says, Not everyone that says unto me, Lord, Lord, shall enter into the kingdom of heaven, but he that doth my will of my Father which is in heaven. Many will say to me in that day, Lord, Lord, have we not prophesied in your name, and in your name have cast out devils, and in your name done many wonderful works. And then I will profess to them, I never knew you. Depart from me, ye that work iniquity. Yeah. People that say, I'm, I'm doing all the works, and I'm doing all these other things, and maybe I'm speaking in tongues, and I'm all this. And Jesus said, I don't know who you are. These people are not Christians. They never accepted Christ in their heart. They never followed his commandment to love. The Jews suffered a lot at the hands of the anti-Semites that claimed to be Christians, especially in Europe. They did not realize that these people are the people that Jesus knew them not, and it made it even harder for a Jew to accept Christ. So now we're moving up, you know, further in time, and they see that the Christians are actually anti-Semitic, and they're actually harming the Jews, killing them, torturing them. I don't have anything to do with their religion. Right. They don't understand that they're not even doing their own religion. They're mm-hmm. calling themselves Christians, but Jesus says, you're not Christians. Mm-hmm. It, it's easy to get confused. Yeah. Now let's talk about the accusations against the Jews, which is also a part of the, uh, the subject of anti-Semitism. The Jews were accused of being Christ killers. You know how many times a Gentile boy said, you're a Jew, you're a Christ killer? You mean somebody said that to you? As a kid, yeah. You're, you're kidding. I mean... And I was also called Jewish racial slurs, you know. I don't want to repeat them right now, but there wasn't often, but there were some, some rotten kids in my town that, that, that were anti-Semitic. Oh, really? And they used to make fun of the Hasidim. I mean, it was I, awful. I, I want to apologize for them. That's not right. It it wasn't right. You don't yeah. you don't need to apologize. I know, I know it wasn't right, and I know when his children they're just ignorance and just passing on the hatred of their parents or whoever. Right. So anyway, even the Nazis told the Jews they were being punished for killing Christ. Some of them said that as they were torturing them. But let's look at it this way. Uh, this is kind of going off a little bit. Imagine that a court case was set up charging the Jewish people for killing Jesus. And the prosecutor then tells the court all about the Pharisees and the Sadducees, how they turned the Jews over to the Romans and demanding his death. Then the defense is allowed to call their first witness. And in walks into the courtroom, the first witness, none other than Jesus Christ himself. He is alive. He is alive indeed. Right? Is Jesus not alive? Yes, he is. No court in the world would ever convict somebody of murder if the victim's alive, right? It's mm-hmm. not murder if the victim survived it. Mm-hmm. Maybe attempted murder, maybe accessory to attempted murder, but they didn't kill Christ because Christ didn't die. I mean, he was dead for three days, but he came back to life again. Mm-hmm. Jesus exonerated the Jews by being resurrected. Mm-hmm. Okay? And the blood libel of Jews putting Gentile blood in their matzahs, there's no such thing. No Jew would ever put blood in their matzah. Oh, yeah, that's... I mean, the, there's a strict that's... prohibition against eating blood. I mean, what the Jews go through to, to make their meat, to get rid of all the blood in their meat. I know. It's just it's just a lie. I, I, and when they do that, the meat is is not as good. I mean, honestly. I... It, it, 
Yeah, okay. L uh, let me just okay. forget that. Now let's move into the present. We have a glimmer of hope for today. What about today? First of all, there was a tremendously wonderful reformation of the church. When Martin Luther reformed the church and created the original Protestant church. Moving away from the bizarre rituals and belief of the Roman church at the time, he restored the concept of salvation by grace through faith, and he got the people to start reading the Bibles themselves. Mm -hmm. But even Martin Luther himself was a flawed man. Despite the tremendous good he did, he was also a vehement anti-Semite. I heard he was very resentful of the Jews because they didn't immediately flock to his Protestant church. I think he forgot about the uh, concept of the stiff-necked people. Yeah. Sorry about that. Well, anyway, you know, a lot of people, I mean, everybody has good and bad. Some people do wonderful things, but they, gotta, they, they do some bad things, too. That's the nature of human. We all have a sinful nature. Anyway, another, another wonderful movement that we have today is the Messianic Jewish movement where some Jews today, like myself, are able to see Jesus Christ as our Mashiach, our, our Messiah, Yeshua, that's his Hebrew name, and cut away all the negative stuff that was piled onto Christianity, and finally see that he is the way, the light, and the life for us Jews too. In Israel, there is a wonderful, there's probably more than one, there are wonderful organizations in Israel that do an amazing job of Messianic Jewish apologetics and sh really show us that Jesus was for us Jews all along. And it's very promising because this is something that's growing. Really? Yeah. Interesting. Now let's talk about Rabbi Kaduri. He was one of the chief rabbis of Israel. The story goes with Rabbi Kaduri was that he told his disciples that it was revealed to him by God the name of the Messiah. And that he was going to write it down on a piece of paper but the condition was no one was allowed to read the piece of paper until he was dead for two years. Hmm. So he was scared of what would happen to him if it got read. So, after two years, they found the piece of paper and opened it, and it had a sentence in Hebrew. The sentence itself did not identify the Messiah, but when they took the first letter of each word, it spelled out Yehoshua, which is Joshua. And many Christians were very excited. Yehoshua sounds like Yeshua. It's close to Jesus. But it wasn't Jesus. It was Joshua. But I decided that my faith will not be increased if Rabbi Kaduri identifies Jesus, and it won't be diminished if he doesn't. Okay? I won't let somebody else diminish my faith. But then I noticed, reading the sentence again, there was a very basic grammatical error in the Hebrew. Not something that Rabbi Kaduri, a great learned man, would accidentally make. It was a very obvious, blatant grammatical error. And I went online and saw that there were other people that noticed it too. So what we did was we corrected the grammatical mistake and then took the first letters of each word and it didn't spell out Joshua anymore. It didn't spell out Yehoshua anymore. It spelled out Yah Yeshua, God Jesus. Really? God, not just Jesus, but God Jesus. Interesting. Rabbi Kaduri revealed that the Messiah not only is Jesus, but he is also God. Hmm. Interesting. That now, who is he? Him. He was a chief rabbi in Israel. Uh, how long ago did he die? I think within the last 10 years. Really? It's very recent. Oh, wow. Yeah. He was the head rabbi of the, I think, believe the Sephardic community there. Wow. Yeah, I know. It's an amazing story. When you when you correct a grammatical error, you, you know, I mean, I couldn't believe it. I mean, it was, it was more than I could have ever hoped for. Wow, interesting. So possibly the rabbi had given himself to Jesus, you think? Now, can you imagine? Probably, can you imagine? He was so scared to reveal the name, right, that he wanted to wait until two years after his death and then hit it with a grammatical error. Hmm. That only the really... The people that really looked at it would figure it out. That's, interesting. That's that's really interesting. Now let's talk about the salvation of the Jews. The question is, will the Jews be saved? And I would like to end with this quote from Romans chapter 11, verses 25 through 27. For I would not, brethren, 
that you should be ignorant of this mystery, lest ye should be wise in your own conceits, that blindness in part has happened to Israel until the fullness of the, fullness of the Gentiles be come in. The Jews have been blinded to Christ. And so all Israel shall be saved, as it is written, there shall come out of Zion the deliverer, and shall turn away ungodliness from Jacob. For this is my covenant with them, when I shall take away their sins. So don't worry about the Jews. And don't ever assume anybody is not saved. Because just as we see in Romans, there is an opportunity at the end, at the end of one's life, to come to, come to Christ. And the Jews are given the opportunity at the very end, when the blindness is taken away and they see Jesus is the Messiah, they have the opportunity to come to Christ. So if today you meet someone who is not saved, that doesn't mean he won't be saved at the Boy, very that's end. that's a long way to wait, especially for people that say the Lord would tarry and not 20, another 20 years. That would be a long time for them to wait. So I, 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 I hope you're not saying, which I don't think you are, that we shouldn't keep, you know, sharing Christ with, with Jews. Oh, of course not. I mean, okay. definitely should. <clears throat> I mean, you know, I don't think it's a good idea to wait till the very last minute. No. You know what I'm saying? I'm, no. not, I'm not even suggesting that. I'm saying that the Jewish people will be given an opportunity at the end, but that does not free them from accepting Christ now. And mm -hmm. anybody you can bring to Christ now is great because you don't know when the end's going to be right you know you can say you know what i'm not going to accept christ until next week and then you can walk out the door and, and and be hit by a car and die right sooner is always better than later but what's interesting is in matthew chapter 19 verse 30 it does say but many that are first shall be last and the last shall be first mm -hmm. the order of people entering heaven is not the order in which they are saved. Okay. And um, yes, definitely share the word with the Jews, but don't, don't, don't be mean and don't harass them, please. Just. Well, that's teach that's them to about, anyone. Teach that's them, to anybody. Teach them about the love of Christ. Teach right. them about the salvation of Christ. <clears throat> don't hit anybody over the head with. If you don't listen to me, you're going to hell, because that just turns people off. Well. The Bible says it's his kindness that brings us to exactly. repentance. So, um, <clears throat> and talking about repentance, I'd like to talk to my listeners right now that may not have accepted the Lord as their Savior, Lord Jesus as their Savior, and would like to do that right now. And um, the Bible says that all have sinned and fallen short of the glory of God. That means that everyone here has sinned, and we had to come to grips with the fact that that Jesus paid the price for us um, on the cross. Um, in John 3.16, it says, For God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten Son, that whosoever should believe in him shall not perish, but have everlasting life. So <clears throat> Jesus is the way, the truth, and the life. No man comes to the Father but through Jesus. So I want to invite all of you out there that have not made a commitment to Christ yet to give your hearts to the Lord. Today is the day. <clears throat> it's just a simple prayer, inviting him to cleanse your heart. And there's an element of repentance there meaning that although you're not under the law, you're, you're sorry and repentant for all the things that you've done and that you plan to change. And only he can help you with that change. So by accepting him into your heart, you will, he will help you change your direction. So um, follow me, dear Jesus. Come into my heart and forgive me for all of the sins that I've said, done, or thought. Cleanse me of the things that I've done in the past, in the present, in even in the future. Help me with remembering to read your word every day 
at least just a little bit. Help me to find a church that you would want me to learn um, and grow in. I ask this all in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. So if you have said that prayer and um, meant it in your heart, give us a call here at Hope Radio, or you can go to my website, On the Road with Jesus, and send me an email. And you are now a child of Christ, and you can tell people that you're a follower of Jesus right now, which you are. Um, I want to thank my guests, um, Carrie, for coming again. God bless you for that traffic that you hit and made worry, it all the way here. Don't worry about that. <clears throat> and for you listeners, I thank you for joining us. You, we will be here every Tuesday at 11 to 12 and every Wednesday at 11 to 12. And so join us on Tuesdays and Wednesdays. And we're signing off. God bless you. Bye for now. And the light that shines As we journey through this life We find His peace inside